Management of Severe Preeclampsia The management of severe preeclampsia is based on careful assessment, stabilization, continued monitoring, and delivery at the optimal time for the mother and her baby. This means controlling blood pressure and, if necessary, convulsions. Senior obstetric and anesthetic staff and experienced midwives should be involved. How should we control the blood pressure? Antihypertensive treatment should be started in women with a systolic blood pressure over 160 millimeters of mercury or a diastolic blood pressure over 110 millimeters of mercury. In women with other markers of potentially severe disease, treatment can be considered at lower degrees of hypertension. The betalol given orally or intravenously, nifedipine given orally, or intravenous hydralazine can be used for the acute management of severe hypertension. In moderate hypertension, treatment may assist prolongation of the pregnancy. Clinicians should use agents with which they are familiar. Atenolol, angiotensin converting enzymes or ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blocking drugs or ARB, and diuretics should be avoided. Nifedipine should be given orally, not sublingually. The betalol should be avoided in women with known asthma. There has been a general consensus that blood pressure greater than 170 over 110 millimeters of mercury requires treatment in the maternal interest, although this is not supported by randomized trials. There is, however, a clear rationale supported by the desire to prevent the known risk of vascular damage due to uncontrolled hypertension. The confidential inquiries into maternal deaths have suggested a lower threshold of 160 millimeters of mercury systolic. The preferred therapeutic agents are labetalol, nifedipine, or hydralazine. Labetalol has the advantage that it can be given initially by mouth in severe hypertension and then, if needed, intravenously. There is also a consensus that if the blood pressure is below 160 over 100 millimeters of mercury, there is no immediate need for antihypertensive therapy. An exception may be if there are markers of potentially more severe disease, such as heavy proteinuria, or disordered liver, or hematological test results. Since in this situation, alarming rises in blood pressure may be anticipated, antihypertensive treatment at lower blood pressure levels may be justified. There is continuing debate concerning women with a blood pressure between 100 mm of mercury and 110 mm of mercury diastolic. Maternal treatment is associated with a reduction of severe hypertensive crisis and a reduction in the need for further antihypertensive therapy. However, there appears to be a small reduction in infant birth weight. With treatment, a prolongation of pregnancy of an average of 15 days is possible as long as there is no other reason to deliver. Methyl dopa and labetalol were the most commonly used therapies in the UK. Doctors use the drug with which they are familiar. Atenolol is associated with an increase in fetal growth restriction. ACE inhibitors and ARBs would appear to be contraindicated because of unacceptable fetal adverse effects. Diuretics are relatively contraindicated for hypertension and should be reserved for pulmonary edema. How should seizures be prevented? Magnesium sulfate should be considered for women with preeclampsia for whom there is concern about the risk of eclampsia. 
This is usually in the context of severe preeclampsia once a delivery decision has been made and in the immediate postpartum period. In women with less severe disease, the decision is less clear and will depend on individual case assessment. The MAGPIE study, or the magnesium sulfate for prevention of eclampsia, has demonstrated that administration of magnesium sulfate to women with preeclampsia reduces the risk of an eclamptic seizure. Women allocated magnesium sulfate had a 58% lower risk of an eclamptic seizure. The relative risk reduction was similar regardless of the severity of preeclampsia. When conservative management of a woman with severe hypertension and a premature fetus is made, it would be reasonable not to treat until the decision to deliver has been made. If magnesium sulfate is given, it should be continued for 24 hours following delivery or 24 hours after the last seizure, whichever is the latter, unless there is a clinical reason to continue. When magnesium sulfate is given, regular assessment of the urine output, maternal reflexes, respiratory rate, and oxygen saturation is important. How should seizures be controlled? The principles of management should follow the basic principles of airway, breathing, and circulation. Magnesium sulfate is a therapy of choice to control seizures. A loading dose of 4 grams should be given by infusion pump over 5 to 10 minutes, followed by a further infusion of 1 gram per hour, maintained for 24 hours, after the last seizure. Recurrent seizures should be treated with either a further bolus of 2 grams of magnesium sulfate or an increase in the infusion rate to 1.5 grams or 2.0 grams per hour. Do not leave the woman alone but call for help, including appropriate personnel such as the anesthetist and senior obstetrician. Ensure that it is safe to approach the woman and aim to prevent maternal injury during the convulsion. Place the woman in the left lateral position and administer oxygen. Assess the airway and breathing and check pulse and blood pressure. Pulse oximetry is helpful. Once stabilized, plans should be made to deliver the woman but there is no particular hurry and a delay of several hours to make sure the correct care is in hand is acceptable, assuming that there is no acute fetal concern such as a fetal bradycardia. The woman's condition will always take priority over the fetal condition. Magnesium sulfate is a therapy of choice and diazepam and phenytoin should no longer be used as first-line drugs. The intravenous route is associated with fewer adverse effects. Magnesium toxicity is unlikely with these regimens and levels do not need to be routinely measured. Magnesium sulfate is mostly excreted in the urine. Urine output should be closely observed and if it becomes reduced below 20 milliliters per hour, the magnesium infusion should be halted. Magnesium toxicity can be assessed by clinical assessment as it causes a loss of deep tendon reflexes and respiratory depression. If there is a loss of deep tendon reflexes, the magnesium sulfate infusion should be halted. Calcium gluconate of 1 gram or 10 milliliters over 10 minutes can be given if there is concern over respiratory depression. If there are repeated seizures, then alternative agents such as diazepam or thiopenthon may be used, but only as single doses since prolonged use of diazepam is associated with an increase in maternal death. If convulsions persist, intubation is likely to be necessary to protect the airway and maintain oxygenation. 
transfer to intensive care facilities with intermittent positive pressure ventilation is appropriate in these circumstances. How should fluid balance be managed? Fluid restriction is advisable to reduce the risk of fluid overload in the intrapartum and postpartum periods. In usual circumstances, total fluids should be limited to 80 milliliters per hour or 1 milliliters per kilogram per hour. Over the last 20 years, pulmonary edema has been a significant cause of maternal death. This has often been associated with inappropriate fluid management. There is no evidence of the benefit of fluid expansion and a fluid restriction regimen is associated with good maternal outcome. The regime of fluid restriction should be maintained until there is a postpartum diuresis as oliguria is common with severe preeclampsia. If there is associated maternal hemorrhage, fluid balance is more difficult and fluid restriction is inappropriate.